Yes, kia ora whanau. Welcome back into Runner Straight here in our fantastic studio. It's week two of NRL finals, and I'm here with the crew again, Ethram Dills and the man himself, Kora Wurumu. Kia ora, brothers. Kia ora, morena. It's great to be here. How was your weekend? Yeah, busy. Busy weekend. A bit of work on Saturday and then uh, visiting some whanau and then some late games, yep. some late games keep you up, keep me up Friday, Saturday night, but worth it. Yeah, some great rugby league played over the weekend. Those nine fifty games, man, I struggle a bit to stay up, but <laughs> hey, I got through it. But enough of our talking. Let's go to the man himself, Ephraim. What's going on? What's the news, bro? Uh, well, before we do the news, we'll start off with some comments again, like we did last week. Perfect. Uh, the people were loving that you guys responded to some of their wise statements in the comments so we've, i've got a few here again starting off with teo on tra 7918 yeah i reckon shorten the regular season by two to three games and chuck an international period in the season or a little after so the players still get their off season what do you guys think of that that was kind of an agreement with what you guys mm. were saying. yeah we've got to find some way and we spoke about this last week about the importance of developing and having a regular and consistent international period throughout our year. Um, it's difficult at the moment, and I understand that. I understand both sides. I really want the international game to flourish, and players want to play internationals. There's a real hunger and a thirst from the fan to want to see their, no their nations play and go at it. But as it is now, and, and a lot of people aren't aware of this, that if the NRL cut games... That decreases the the, uh, the money that they get from the networks and the broadcasting, which decreases the salary cap and it mm -hmm. takes away from the players' earning power, which is what they wouldn't go for. So I totally understand that. The more games there are throughout the course of the season, the more money the game gets and the clubs and the players in turn get. So I don't think they'll be willing to go forego some of that in order for them. But we still need to try and fit it in. It's... it's I, I love the thinking, I love the thought to try and squeeze it in that way and that's the most common sense way to try and do it because there's only so much time throughout the year. But, you know, we've got to try and keep squeezing and we're going to, to England in a couple of weeks' time and because of the constrictions of time and the, the length of the season, our test series is now two instead of a three-match mm -hmm. series because of it. I would have loved a three-match series but... We've got to think of the players and their, the long-term good of them and the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Willie answered all the questions for the bro. So I think the, the, both, the, both the important thing for both Willie and I is to have more international games. We want it. We want more international games. We fit in the calendar. That's up to the NRL side as well. Um, they have a big say. Like Willie said, there's money, there's all these, you know, I guess Channel 9, Fox, all these guys that had to come into consideration with it as well. So for us... Man, chuck us in more international games, but where you fit into the into the competition, that's must be the next hardest question that has to be answered or asked, you know, is who and where they're going to put the games and what time of the year they're going to do it. Because as you put it further and further at the back end of the season, the season just gets longer and longer. And that's hence, like Willie said, that's why they've only got two test matches over in the UK. But there's also a little bit for me, and I, I look at the All Blacks and their season. Mm. They play 10, 11 games a year. And they're still playing to November every single year. And you're seeing All Blacks. I think uh, Sam Kane may be coming up to 100 this week. And we're seeing a lot of them exceed that, you know, because of the amount of games that they mm -hmm. put on. Are we telling our players, that's not good for you? We can't be doing that. Or can it be done? Can we still, can we do it every year and still fit it in? Mm. and stress the importance to these players and give them a remuneration and a reward financially because of this to make them play that. We can still recover. I'm still sure I'm, I'm sure still that the NRL product will be great because mm. Super Rugby's still good you know, with the All Blacks. Yes, some are having sabbaticals and having a break, but the international game is healthy and I think that's something we've got to look at. 
Yeah, for sure. Um, if you guys are excited about the international game, stay tuned till the end of the show when Adam and Willie will be talking about teams for the upcoming international games just around the corner. The next comment is from Jose Axi. Sorry, these names are just kind of oh, just out random of this letters planet, put together. <laughs> uh, this one's not league related at all. Uh, top four favorite movies of all time. Have you guys got a favorite movie? <laughs> oh, geez, he's put us on the spot. <laughs> Um, what's that? Um, I like, I like the Gladiator. I like the Gladiator. Really enjoyed the Gladiator movie. What's the Will Smith one with his son and he sells the uh, the sewing machines and stuff or whatever those pursuit of happiness. Pursuit of happiness. I really enjoyed just the storylines behind it. And another one I like, and I'll explain the reason why I choose this one, is any of the Saw movies. Any of the Saw <laughs> movies, okay? It's a funny story. I, I meet my wife now, girlfriend at the time. I took her on a date and I went, I don't know why I took her to Saw, but I took her to the Saw. I think it was five back then. The reason why I enjoy the Saw movies is I really wanted to get into sports psychology. And I just love how the mind works, okay? So they get put into these situations where it's, live or die and there's there's always an option to live but it's when you put under a little bit of stress and a bit of adversity is how do you overcome those things so me being me and me liking the way the brain thinks I really enjoyed those those kind of movies because of the whole purpose of hey how do, how are you going to react under pressure and then I kind of related to rugby league you know when you go through those tough times through in the grinds and you're in the deep dark place how are you going to get yourself out of those situations so those are my fir- my three. I can't think of a fourth off the top of my head, but that's my reasons for those movies. Uh, Boys in the Hood was one. That was my go-to, especially when I was a young fella. And then uh, Friday was around that time. Yep. wasn't too far after and a real good laugh. Uh, can't really think of too many others. I, I don't do horrors. I don't do horrors. My wife loves the horror, but I, I can't be done with them more. The comedy serial or biology, biographies. I love a biography, you know, a story about someone learning about their journey and mm. um, a bit like The Pursuit of Happiness. That was yeah. a true story that, yeah, hard. about someone's journey being at the bottom and getting himself to the top, which was amazing. I don't. I don't go by the top four favorites. I just stick to my number one favorite, which is The Social Network, the one about Facebook, how it got founded. That's my favorite movie. Um, last comment for the bro from the bro Jonah Tao, who commented last week as well, oh, which is why he says, sorry for the spamming boys, but with the season coming to an end, should the NRL start to introduce a strict trading period and draft for young players and free agents so it doesn't interfere with regular season example big names like luai and afb who still play for their clubs but in the back of fans minds they are already leaving mm. question only came up because the rumor of christian welch rumored to be leaving this is not something i want to think about as a storm fan in the finals are you guys in favor of some sort of uh trading period like maybe the nba do and stuff like that yeah, I've had a concern about this for as long as this has been around. I think uh, the one that concerned me when it started to concern me was, I think when Tohu signed for the Warriors and he still had a year at the Warriors, I'm at the Melbourne Storm, and I couldn't get my head around how you can sign for someone else but mm-hmm. also be working for another company. It doesn't happen in any other walk of life. You can't sign for another company whilst you're still working for someone else. And an argument that somebody put to me was that players need to plan and be prepared to move. And um, I get that. But again, that doesn't happen in any other walk of life. If you're an accountant or you're a doctor and you get a job at a different hospital, you just up sticks and you've got to move. You've got to find a place to live. You've got to move your kids to school. That's just a fact of life. Why we do it in rugby league, um, I don't get it. I don't get it how we allow it to happen and... Well, exactly what he's saying. As fans, you know somebody's already leaving your club. You know, how invested are they? How how much are they willing to mm. put in? And we saw, and I don't know if this played a part, but Adam Vanua Blake, mm. he had some issues off the field this year. We missed the dressing room and, you know, I don't know if that was in the back of the mind. I'm leaving anyway. Yeah. But also, the player that's at the club now, 
and Royce Hunt's left. But how much of that was influenced by knowing that Adam Fenua Blake's coming there anyway? Mm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So the, the person at that club now, who you're signing to 12 months before, they know that they're going to be out of a job regardless of how they play. I'm on the chopping block here because they've already signed this big name, spent all this big money. I think we need to have a transfer window. We need to have a window at the end of the season. Almost like the NFL where there's a free agency and there's a signing period. All right, players, you can go visit clubs. Mm. You can go around. There might be three or four clubs or five or six, whatever. You and your agent do the rounds. Clubs have a chat to you. You pick out what you think is best. You want to test the market. Go for it if you don't want to sign with your other club. But the fact that you can sign with somebody else it doesn't sit comfortably with me. I've, it's never sat comfortably with me that November the 1st, we're racing to sign people because they might talk to someone else. Uh, you're our worker. You work for me. If you want to work with someone else, then go. Uh, regardless of where you are. If you're not happy here, then go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I guess it's, it's crazy because the salary cap causes this problem as well, is that they see... And the clubs do this exact same thing, I think, Willie, as well. Is like, I guess, for example, the Newcastle Knights and what they're doing with a lot of their players, they, they put them a lot on notice and then they go out and try and look for opportunities while they're still playing at the club. So I think for, for both, I'm going, I'm going to be devil's advocate. I think the clubs do the same thing to the players as well, is that, yes, they're looking for other talent to come to their club, which then has to, like a player gets disgruntled and goes, oh, well, if... They come into my club because they're hearing it through the media. I need to start looking for another opportunity somewhere else. So it goes both ways, I feel like. And I get it from, I guess, your point of view about, you know, if you're you're working there and then you've signed somewhere else, yeah, you you should go because your commitment is to the place that you're working for, not to the commitment that you're going to the year after. And from a fan's point of view is that, like Royce Hunt, like Tohu Harris, if you're a Melbourne Storm, like Christian Walsh, Roush, sorry, um, like, if you're a Storm fan, like, you're invested into the team that's there right now. When you know that he may be going somewhere else, you're like, like you said about Anifanua Blake, is he committed to the cause? And then when he does something wrong, it's like, well, does he want to be here? And I guess that's why fans ask the question around it all. But I do think it does go both ways. But the easy way to do it is to open up a transfer window. Like, that, that changes a lot of things, doesn't it? So if there's somewhere in the competition that you can add that into it, then I think it may settled everything down and people may just finish what they got and then be able to move on. There could be an element too that you jump the gun a bit as a player in in signing. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if after everything that's happened this year for him, we spoke about it early in the season, that if he was was to go on a play origin and he did and was one of New South Wales' best players and talk about him playing for Australia now, if at the time when he was disgruntled about being on the wing at St George. Mm. Zach Lomax, through the course of the season, when everything was flying from mm. on the wing, they thought, maybe I should stay. Maybe I want to stay at St. George. Yeah. Now, maybe Flanagan was right in putting me on the wing, and that is my best position. Mm. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Maybe he jumped the gun. And it allows you, by having this period, to make a, a more calculated decision, Yeah. which is a big decision. Oh, yeah, because he did sign and then a few weeks afterwards he asked to have something else written into yeah. the contract that he'd already signed. Yeah. Well, Brad Arthur had gone in the meantime, <laughs> who he had signed for, so, yeah. Hey, you got a point there, Willie. Uh, we'll move on now to the news. And the first bit of the news, <coughs> it sort of has to do with, as you guys can see, I did put on my Bulldogs jersey. That is the bad omen that caused the Bulldogs to lose three games in a row and get kicked out of the finals but on a more positive jerseys note the kiwis jersey has been revealed and uh obviously throwback to the 2002 jersey that they used to have it's going to be a big seller i think what do you how do you guys rate the jersey i think it's i think it already got sold out pretty much straight away already uh yeah i think it was like you said it was a big hit and i think you know these days it's crazy where where everyone's minds are going back to, like yourself. Look at the jersey you bought, you know what I mean? Like, well, how old are you? You know, you're, you're, young, <laughs> you're younger than us and everyone's winding the clock back and these are the cool things now. It's the old school heritage jersey. It's the O2s. It's before then. It's the, the old patterns, the designs because 
we all remember them and we're like, bro, those are actually all in now. You know what I mean? So I like the Kiwis jersey. I love the story behind it. I think that's the most important thing for me. When you have a jersey, you have to be able to tell a story behind the jersey, not just to have a jersey or have designs or patterns on a jersey that represent the Kiwis. It's the storytelling behind it. So I think the Kiwis have done a great job. Dynasty has come on board, which is great. A New Zealand company, a New Zealand brand who are now doing big things in the game of NRL all over the place have put their name to this, and um, I like the jersey. I think it's pretty cool. I think the boys will feel good in it. And that's the main, like, you know, feel good, look good, play well. Um, obviously, you still got still got to create an environment for them to excel and be a part of, you know, winning big games. But the jersey that they have, man, that's cool. I like it. I'm going to get one of those <laughs> yeah. for free. Yeah, I'm a fan of it. <laughs> <laughs> My son uh, sent me a picture of it. Before I'd actually seen it come Get out, one. and he, he's saying, "How good is this?" And he's right; it's a quality jersey. Mm. There's a real shine to it. To, as Blair he said, there's a, a throwback element to it, going back to some of the, the some of the designs of yesterday. And I think the players will enjoy wearing it. The fans will definitely enjoy, as Blair is saying, they're flocking already to take them off the shelf. So, yeah, it's a win-win uh, for the New Zealand Rugby League, and, and definitely for the players and for Dynasty. I think. That are that are the makers of the jersey, but yeah, what Blair is saying. My son sent me an old Auckland Rugby League jersey. He asked me, "Did I play in it?" And I found an old photo and I, I sent it to him of when I did play in that jersey. And he goes, "Quality." Yeah. And he, he saw some old Winfield Cup jerseys from around that time. Easy. Um, there was an old video, Easy Canberra Raiders jersey, a Dada uniforms, Penrith one. Um, he said. Geez, there were some quality jerseys back then. Some of the designs, there was simplicity about. Yeah, yeah. But just the quality of the jersey back then. And, yeah, he's a, he's a real fan of some of the throwback stuff. And I think he's going to get some of those old jerseys. It's nice to see the Kiwis go back to some of that and remember some of the history. I think it's the simpl simplicity is what you said, Willie. That's that's what's attractive to, that's what everyone's attracting to, eh, is that there's not much going on, but it's the that old school look, but real simple with what they've been able to do and then storytelling at the same time. Both men and women have a great jersey. So it's, you know, the women's have got one as well, which is great as well. So yeah, good jersey. Let's try and get some of those, eh? We sure should. Tell the boss to try and this, get some. How about this for like poetry? The the 2002 jersey that it's based on, that was the first uh, season that Stacey Jones captained the Kiwis and obviously hey. was the coach. So well, some good. Hey, circles, let's, let's hope they put a bloody... Uh, video about and, and talking to Stace around this stuff. I think, you know, with the way social media is working now, it's always good to story tell some of these journeys. It'd be nice to see Stacey Jones t sit down and just like, I guess, even just doing his campaign to World Cup, you know what I mean? It's like the New Jersey's coming, he's a new coach into the yep. into the Kiwi space. It's a build up to the World Cup. If, if the social media team over there, NZRL, can do something yep. to try and build up this World Cup, but also build up the international space getting players involved, getting some behind-the-scenes stuff. I think, you know, you've seen the Warriors do it this year and how they can be a lot more engaging into the fans and the fans want to know what these players are about. And it's a real personal space, to, an international space in the Kiwi space, but I think if you can open that up, I think the boys now are more reluctant to speaking about their journeys, but also giving the fans an insight to what they do day-to-day. Stacey Jones, man, an icon of Rugby League here in New Zealand. If you can get him sitting down chatting through his whole journey to 2026 World Cup, man, that could be a, a big doco on the boat. You yep. know what I mean? It'd be awesome. Uh, moving on to uh, some unfortunate news about Trey Fuller done his ACL playing for the Red Cliff Dolphins over the weekend, which I thought that the Dolphins, the top team, was also the Red Cliff Dolphins, but apparently no, they just the don't Dolphins. like being called Red Cliff at all. Mm. They just want to be the Dolphins. Which is kind of weird, but anyway, so their second grade team, the Redcliffe Dolphins, he was playing for them, uh, ruptured his ACL. Looks like he'll be back around halfway through next season. Uh, pretty gutting for him eh, at 27 yeah, years old. Yeah, um, just going back to that Redcliffe Dolphins, have you seen the rivalry between the Brisbane Broncos and the Dolphins at the moment? And when they refer back to the Dolphins, they call them the Redcliffe Dolphins, the players, you know what I mean? So they know, like you said, they hate being called Redcliffe Dolphins. They want to be known as the Dolphins, but the players play to it as well. So there must be something going on there of those fellas. But yeah, Trey 
for like I thought he was an outstanding player this year for the Dolphins. I thought what he did and what he's been able to do also got an upgrade into the top is it top thirty? Into the top thirty, a contract. Um he played tough. He was consistent every time he played for the Dolphins, but then obviously playing Queensland Cup in the semis and doing the ACL is unfortunate, man. This is rugby league though. I guess, you know, things, you know, when highs are highs, highs are highs, and when lows are lows, this is part of rugby league and it's unfortunate for him. But you know, on the men, nine months of hard work now has to get put into them and get back out on the field because he's he's a great player. Great player. Yeah, he's been fantastic. And the more he played, the better he got. And there is there's a big difference between New South Wales Cup or Queensland Cup and first grade NRL. And it takes some players a little while to get used to, but he took to it like a duck to water and, and got better at it as his his minutes increased. Mm. And, to the point where they moved Hammer to centre for a little while just to accommodate him, and he was he was great. It's a shame that it, his season's ended this way, playing in the Queensland Cup. But, yeah, he's got a an opportunity now, especially with Christian Wolf, to get some more opportunities, unfortunately. That won't come at the start of next season, but what he has now is an opportunity to get fit, get his body right, along with his knee, most importantly, but also take the learnings out of this adversity that he's facing this can be life-changing for a player to come out the other side of this a lot mentally tougher mm. after after going through something like this an ACL injury is is horrific and it's such a long time to go through and he'll go through some dark periods but as I say because of those lows that he's going to feel he'll be much better for it coming out the other side of it when he gets back on the field next season and we'll be looking forward to that. I mean, just the taste of the Ray Fuller hammer at centre with Herbie as the other centre against the Broncos. The 40-6 to six drubbing in round 26. I just want to see that again. So good luck on your recovery, Trey. But speaking of the Broncos, uh, Reese Walsh looks like, it's not confirmed yet, but looks like he's going to uh, re-sign for a reported $1.1 million a season four-year deal at the Broncos. Uh, people have been saying that it's a, an underpayment, uh, like they're getting a bargain on him with that money. Obviously, they have a bunch of other people off contract. Uh, Cobo, who looks set to explore his options, mm. and also uh, Katoni Staggs. As you guys have said, Sam Walker is someone that they probably may want to target. So they need as much money as they can get their hands on. It seems like they might have been able to get a lower uh, cost on the Reese Walsh re-signing. Yeah, I think a lot of conversations go into this. I think around Reese Walsh's, you know, and you just mentioned it, there's someone like, I guess, Sam Walker that, you know, that may be of interest to the Broncos. Mm. And I guess when you sit down and talk to Sam Walker as a as a club, and you're saying, "Hey, this," they would have said that they're trying to target a few players, and to target a few players, and he sets himself up for four. Was it five years? Did you say four years. Four years, and they're saying, "Oh, we, we're going to try and target Sam Walker. We're going to try and target a few other players." So you may have to take unders, and that is definitely unders for him. But he could get one point three if he goes somewhere else. You know what I mean? But I think. What they've sold to him, and this is just me hypothetically thinking, is that there's there's a group of players that they want to target that's going to help set him and the Broncos up for success. So I think it's a great signing. I know it's only a handshake at the moment. Hopefully that becomes a, a sign agreement rather than just a handshake because anything can change in a game of rugby league. But I definitely think they've sat down with him and explained to him the options of other players coming in and how that's going to help his game. This is why the money's at where it is. Yeah, he's he has great marketing, marketable ability for the game, but also for the Broncos. He's a fan favourite. He has a he's a big attraction for the younger audience of the game. And wherever he goes, he's the superstar. Mm. You know, I remember when they came here to play the Warriors. I was just walking up to where the commentary box was and the fans just flocked to the bus. There he is, there's Reese Walsh. Everyone's taking photos. That's who Reese Walsh is now. He's, he's a rock star in our game. But his game isn't quite perfect on the mm. field yet. He's, his highlights are outstanding, but he has some lowlights that he needs to fix up 
for consistency wise, and then he can start earning maximum. It's a great signing from the Broncos on the fact that we spoke about the viewing figures that the NRL has had this year and how, how big it's been. So whenever the next TV contract comes up, the broadcasting deal comes up again, they're in a strong position, mm. the game, to negotiate even more money. So as I said before, when they get more money, the salary cap increases. So they've got more more money to play with. Do you know what I mean? So these clubs, they're signing today with the thought of the future and you know the ability that they'll have mm. in a couple of years' time to have more money to play with and sign more players. So it's, it is a big contract. It's a huge contract what he's signed now. But it gives them the ability to sign maybe a Sam Walker mm. a little bit later, later with the forethought and the idea that yeah. uh, we've, we've got this scope of increasing our revenue and our TV money it's a, with an eye that the salary cap's going to increase. So, yeah, they're going to have some big, big earners within mm. there and um, he's a big part of their puzzle to keep. Do we, do we know when the TV deals are all up or when they start again? Not quite sure when the next deal is. Do you because, know? yeah, like, that goes into, like you said, that goes into consideration when you're putting contracts in front of players because if it goes up in, I guess, two more years, then if you're saying you're on one million here, 1.1, and then at the back end of that contract, it could be 1.2 in the hope that the t- TV rights or the deals expire and then they sign again. When is it, does it say? 2027. 2027. What well, does it take him to 2029, eh? The contract's to 2029. Yeah, so, so I think there'll be a back-ended deal in there, which sometimes can get you into a bit of trouble as a club. <laughs> but the way the game's growing, I don't feel like they put themselves in any danger of having getting stuck with a lot of this money to pay him because as the game gets bigger, which yep. it is every single year, as the deals come at 2027 that um, salary cap goes up no matter what. And I feel like this is a good plan and concession for, I guess, trying to bring other players in, like Sam Walker, just for example, that they can put more money into the back end of that, that contract for him yeah. so that when the right, the, I guess the salary cap goes up, they can add some more to it. Something I didn't mention is that it is a four-year extension, but from the end of next season. So next season, Reece Walsh is still getting mm. 600000 mm. Which yeah. means next season they still uh, it's more affordable for, like I said before, Stags and Cobo. Stags yeah. on seven hundred thousand uh, a season, Cobo on six twenty five expected to go up, and obviously, him specifically seems like is it's a bit more tenuous whether or not he'll stay because very sought after Origin player and kind of has had a bit of a. Rocky season, you could say, at some points. Do you guys think that Please. he'll stick around if he gets the raise and money as well, or they prioritise like someone like Sam Walker bringing in? Yeah, well, I think, you know, for for, for, for Cobbo, I think he he should stay. Like, what? Who's? There's a couple of guys leaving, um, and I think Tony Staggs is a, a is an important part of their Broncos as well. In the centre, he is a strike centre. So I would be trying to give him some money to keep him there. I think he's a quality player. So is Cobo. Like he said, he's been up and down with this. He's only a young kid. Plenty of time. The pressure of Origin, the pressure of NRL every single day consistently. Yes, they get paid big money. Here we are, we're saying it's only 600 or, you know what I mean, 700 a million. Like that's a lot of money for any person. But in the game of NRL, that's just like your standard way, Jay, when it comes to these top players. So when you compare it to like just normal life and what they get, what they get, it's crazy amount of money. So he's got a lot of work to do, I think, Cobo. Just more so the mental side of things, I think. You know, being so young and having to be tough in, the, in, the, in the, one of the tougher competition, I think, in the world when it comes to contact, like I think he just needs to just hold still, keep learning, keep developing because that club will go places as long as they actually want to get down and work hard for sure. But, you know, it's all well and good paying these fellas big money. they still got to deliver on the big stage consistently. Yeah, and there's a lot of these outside backs that have ambitions to play fullback. And that's where the big money is as an outside back. Fullback, such an influential player. We've seen the money that, spoken about it now, that... Reese Walsh is getting, and I think he, Cobbo, has has a taste and a flavour to play fullback. Mm-hmm. Um, my personal opinion on it, 
for what it's worth, I think he's a fantastic winger. It's a bit like Lomax. Mm. I think he's an outstanding winger. He wants to play centre, but I don't think he's quite there defensively. Mm. He's been, he can get caught short, especially moving laterally against good ball players and people with good feet, fast feet. And fullback is a tough position to play. You cover so many metres and you've got to be so fit both defensively and offensively. You're running long metres on the sweep lines and that's tough to do. You know, throughout the course of an 80-minute game and do it week in and week out, I I think for him to be the superstar that he wants to be, he's, he's a winner. That's where he's best at. For the Broncos, salary cap-wise, I think... Katani Staggs is really important, mm. as Blair is saying. But they've also got the likes of Dean Mariner, mm. who's coming through, and he's a cheapie. Mm. He's still in, in the infancy of his career. He's still learning his trade and finding his feet at first grade level. But they try, they see him as a possible centre, as they showed it at the back end of the season. So that may be what they do. And I think we, are, we see this dragging on for a little bit. But back to what we spoke about, a little while ago, if we had this signing window at the end of next season, see out your contract, show some loyalty, or another club pays you and you go now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, simple as that for me. I just think sometimes, and I know it's hard in the game of rugby league, but for these young guys coming through, some patience would be be good for them, you know, just being patient and backing their ability. Yep. You know what I mean? Like we all know what Cobo can bring. Yes, he's still young in his, in his career of rugby league. He's played so much football so, at such a young age. But being patient and backing your hard work that it will come. The, the, the time will come where the money will be given to you when you're ready. But I think with today's day and age and the game where it's going is that people are throwing big money at a lot of these players and I think that's where we start getting caught up in the old, are we chasing the money or are we trying to be the best player we can be so that we can have a long career in, in rugby league? Yes, sometimes things happen in the game of rugby league and you could have a career-ending injury and you want to take the money when it's an offer. But I think when you're good enough, you're going to be good enough. You know what I mean? So being patient, and it's hard in rugby to be patient, but I think for him, it's just being patient and backing himself that he's going to be the best player he can be. Yep. And then things just go, boom, it's just given to him then. You know what I mean? That's when the money starts coming. Knuckle, knuckle down and nail down a position and just be the best you can be for the team. And you never know what will happen. You know what I mean? Like a preseason can do the world of good yep. for any player. So get for a preseason, work your butt off, knuckle down a winger, centre, fullback, whatever you're going to be, and then the offers come. Yep. Speaking of taking... Um career opportunities while they're available to you. Josh Schuster is back. He's signed on uh, with the Rabbitohs, a one-year uh, deal until the end of 2025. Wayne Bennett coming in, can he turn it around for him like we spoke? It's been a while, obviously, since this he first got ousted from the mm. Seagulls and you guys talked about the storm, good mm. place to revive. Is Wayne Bennett another guy that can bring him back to what he was originally uh, prospected to be when he was coming yeah, to I would have loved to see him go to the Storm, and that's why we said it. I just think getting away from the Sydney spotlight would have been beneficial for his development and being the best player that he could be away from all the distractions. He's obviously chosen to go to the Rabbitohs. Uh, Wayne Bennett's a big part of, obviously, those conversations, and I think Wayne Bennett can definitely help him. But at the end of the day, as a player, it comes back to you, how much you want to make this actually your career, how hard do you want to work to get yourself back into where you know you can be. What position is he? I think he's a back rower. I think he's a back rower, but he needs to he needs to be fit. He needs to get for a preseason. He needs to want it. He needs to get his mental, mental side of the, the football done right on and off the field. So I think it's a great signing for, for South Sydney Rabbitohs. I think he can be a big part of the, the future moving forward with Wayne Bennett. One year actually has, has to work for it. Like when you give someone uh, an opportunity and you only got a one year to show what you can give, it actually means that you have to work really hard in the off season to be fit, be ready to take on the season. So if anyone can change, I guess, his mindset and the player that he can be, it's Wayne Bennett and put him alongside some of those great players that they have down there for next year. I think he could be a big part of their future. Yeah, well, we spoke about Melbourne and how strong their culture is down there and how strong the leadership of Craig Bellamy and uh, the help he gets from Frank Panisi and how important and how good it would have been if Josh Schuster decided to go there for his learning ability. 
the next bloke that he had to work under, if it wasn't Craig Bellamy, was Wayne Bennett. He mm -hmm. had to go there. And I'm sure he's going to learn a lot. Um, what he will get is honesty. Mm. He'll get honesty. And a story came out last week about Wayne Bennett going straight into the, the Rabbitohs. As soon as they'd finished the season, they'd done with with the Dolphins, the Redcliffe Dolphins. As soon as he'd done with them, he went straight to Sydney. Sad dude. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that aim, isn't it? And uh, he got the South Sydney players in and just give it to them, both barrels between the eyes, about how they need to improve and what they... So that's the honesty that Josh Schuster should expect mm. and what he needs for his career, and we spoke about this before, for him to reach that potential that we know that he's got. He's got to be fit in every single way, in his mind and in his body. And hopefully he's been still training um, because he's got to get on the front foot when he gets to South Sydney when preseason starts again. Mm. There's no doubt he can be a real asset to them. And I'm sure Wayne Bennett, just like he did with Tavita Pangai this year, mm -hmm. will get the best out of him next year. Another guy who's sort of in the same vein uh, as Josh Schuster is Valens Tefare at the Dolphins, where Wayne Bennett's obviously leaving from. Had his time in the sun last season, had a few mean performances for them, uh, especially his Magic Round debut, I remember, was pretty uh, pretty fantastic. But uh, basically, Ben Teal uh, has come out. He coached yep. Valens in the Dolphins' Queensland Cup team. He's come out and said that he really does deserve another crack, even though he hasn't had any NRL experience this season uh, due to various factors to do with fitness, basically, is why he hasn't cracked it back in the top team. But Bentel has said that it would be a tragedy, basically, for no NRL team to pick him up at some point just for what kind of a, a talent and a physical specimen he is. Uh, where do you think... Valence Tefade's future is headed. Is can he come back into what does he need to do to come back into the NRL space? Uh yeah. I haven't watched too much of his Queensland Cup stuff this year. And obviously, like he said, he come onto the scenes a big, you know, and they compared him to Amel Meninga, and that was most probably a bit far fetched at that time because he was only new to the game of rugby league. I think he's only been playing the game of rugby three years, three years. And in that time, he struggled, to be honest. I think the bigger body shape, I think coming from rugby union, the bigger body shape, playing in a critical position, as in the centres, um, is a tough position to be able to learn the game of rugby league if you haven't been getting coached to detail and understanding what's a big part of it. Obviously, he's a big boy, so the off-seasons are really important for some of those guys. Eh? We've, it's, it's in our culture, eh? our Māori and Pacific culture is we have to work extremely hard. We have to watch what we eat in the off-season. We have to keep training, even if it's just moving. You know what I mean? You're not just sitting on the couch eating food and drinking what you want to drink. It's making sure that we do something every single day. So I definitely think he's got a future in rugby league where... I couldn't tell you, again, like like Bully and I, we throw them to Craig Bellamy. We throw them down to Craig Bellamy and you give him an understanding of the game of rugby league. He's been able to convert, and now we're going to talk about a couple of other rugby boys, he's been able to convert these rugby players into some quality footballers. Uh, you go down to the Melbourne Storm, you get the detail. I think that's what he's missing. I think he's missing the work ethic. I think he needs a good culture around him, and I think he needs to get the detail of rugby league. What does that look like? For him as a player, so if they can get, if he can get somewhere like the Melbourne Storm, even if you get into the system and you're still playing Queensland Cup for their feeder teams, you're one step closer to actually learning the game a lot better and getting the more detail around it. Because we've seen what he's been able to do with a lot of players over his time at the Melbourne Storm, especially rugby players. You know, some of the Fijian boys that come from Fiji come into that system. Marika Korobeti, for example, you know, playing for Australia, but he turned them into a Premiership winning winger. Uh, so I think those kind of players who have talent they just need the detail and the confidence and a, and a culture around them to be the best that they can i think if he can get down there and just still be he might still be playing queen of the cup but he's getting some really good coaching there's a couple of things for me uh, he hit the highlights when he went to that magic weekend and he scored two tries on debut mm -hmm. and he became a mythical star in everyone's eyes there's this big fella and the odd shape that he was um powerful and that may be why and his name why people made comparisons with Val Meninga yeah. um, the superstar in the making 
And he had some opportunities because of what he did that season, but then he comes back pre-season by all accounts in worse shape than what he first came. And Wayne Bennett's told him to go away, get yourself fit, you're not going to train with the team. And this is all stuff in the press that I'm talking about. Mm. Wayne Bennett's told him he's not going to train with the team until he gets himself into a decent enough shape that he can handle the workload. Mm. Um, he's got himself in, and in the meantime, he's put himself further and further behind people. So he, I don't think he even got a shot this season for the Dolphins, and he's played the played the season in in Queensland Cup and done really well. But as I said before, the difference between Queensland Cup and NRL is huge. It's huge. There is a big gulf, and yeah, it'd be great if he went down to Melbourne. And I think he'd it'd be great for his career. But at 24, I think it might be time for him to go to Super League. I think he'd go to Super League, um, very little yeah. pressure on him, earn some good money and play every single week. He would do. And Connie Hurrell had some similar mm. struggles in the, in, the, in the NRL, even when he went to the Gold Coast. Mm. Very similar type, shaped body. Definitely. Um, went to Leeds, struggled a bit, but won a couple of grand finals at St. Helens. And is an icon of the place now mm. and still going now. He's in negotiations to possibly go again. So Val could be that type of player mm. and it could be great for him. And if he decides to move, and I think there's a real chance that he could be a superstar if he went to Super League at this moment in time. He could go to Melbourne. He could go to any other club. But I'm not sure if he plays every single week. Mm. But if he wants to be a first grader and play every single week, then Super League's an opportunity for him. Yeah, not a bad shout, Willie. I like that idea. And 7% Val. <laughs> 7? Oh, sorry. You're higher than most of their managers these days. Um, and that Melbourne pathway might actually be a bit more congested considering this next bit of news. Moses Leo uh, is coming to the storm, not next season, but the season after. 26. He is a Paris Olympic Games sevens. Uh, New Zealand representative, and he signed on a two-year deal from... 2026, 2027. Uh, looks like he'll be the next Will Warbrick, next uh, uh, one of those Fijian wingers, any of their basically yeah. converts that they've yeah. continuously well, what, what position? Is he a, a centre winger? I think he's all outside backs. I think he's... Yeah. I, I saw something about him doing full backing at, at okay, one yeah, point yeah. as well. I think, you know, those, those sevens players have to be fit. They have to move quick around the field. They clock up some Ks. Um, yeah, fullback position may be the option there. I guess he's got a bit of time to, when he gets over there, to learn the game. That's the most, first and foremost, the most important thing for him. Like Will Warbrick, it's taken him, I think this is maybe Will's third year, and I feel like he's just coming into his own now. Um, so a lot of detail goes around these rugby players and the, how they can convert into the game of rugby league. I think the winger position helps... I guess these wingers see the game from the outside looking in rather than being in the inside and being in the washing machine having to understand what's going on here. So I do think wingers, centre is a tough position, but I think if you can lock it down, mate, they, uh, they do some great things down in Melbourne. So they get some great players and I guess the culture and the reputation stands above all when it comes to signing players like that. And they he could be another superstar that the Storm get in because Will Warbrick's on fire at the moment and yeah, it's taken him taken him a few years to get to where he is, but time and patience, you know what I mean? Patience, the, the club's backed him, Craig Bellamy's backed him and he's getting the rewards. Yeah, patience, time and effort. You've got to invest some effort as a coach mm. to bring these guys up to speed. They've done it for a long time, the Melbourne Storm and bringing rugby union players over and I go back to, to Cesar Lavea mm. who went across um, Matt Duffy, he was another one. Suliasi Vunivalu, yeah. uh, from, straight from school. Now they've got Will Warbrick straight from the Olympics and the seventh circuit. They see some potential, but they must work hard as coaches to invest the time to educate these guys on the, the nuances and the intricacies of rugby league as in comparison to, to sevens. But they see the athletic ability mm. to start off with. Blair, mentioned it before, we're talking about your point of difference and these sevens players, their point of difference is their fitness and their speed and their athletic ability. Mm. So there's a lot already already there, intangibly, and so it's up to the coaches then to teach them the fine arts of rugby league. 
Now, as you mentioned it, he's on the back of Will Warbrick, Mark Nawanga Tawasi. Mm. He's just come from the Olympics. He already had a game at the Roosters mm -hmm. that nobody, not even Trent Robinson, thought he would do mm. at this time of his career. But there's obviously something in that. We're talking about go, going to South Africa and doing some scouting. Uh, sevens mm. are on our doorstep. Mm. Uh, let's go and have a look at some of them. And there's, These are Kiwi kids. These are guys from New Zealand schools and from New Zealand sevens going to Australian teams. Maybe it's something the Warriors can have a look at too. Maybe the Warriors can do some recruitment there. Mm. Yeah, great work, Definitely, Willie. Well, You're spot on the money, bro. You're on fire today, Willie. <laughs> <laughs> Brother, Something in those muffins. Yeah, <laughs> the coffee's hit you hard. How um, good. So the Warriors have been doing some recruiting, but that is the women's team that I'm referring to. Uh, they've made their first whole batch of signings up to this point, starting off with obviously Uppy Nichols from a week and a bit ago. Uh, the other names, Maya Hilmoana, Capri, Paikau, Harata Butler, Leishon Albert-Jones, Emanita Paki, who just debuted for... Queensland uh, in origin this year. Lavinia Tau Ha La Liku, wow. uh, Matakino Gray. Uh, bro, bro <laughs> Tyler, appreciate you having a crack. Baker. <laughs> yeah, no, appreciate you having a crack. Willie, what's her name? <laughs> <laughs> bro, you're better than me, my cuz. Hey, that's not a Samoan name. Lavinia Tau Ha La Liku. Yeah, there it is, my bro. That's why, I, bro, I told you he's on fire today. <laughs> <laughs> bro, he's holding this show down, bro. <laughs> he's holding it down, man. If I hold it down some more, tell us about these signings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. Well, they're in the process of putting their squad together. They've, they've already got a, an accomplished coach who uh, won a couple of grand finals with the Knights. They've, he's come across, and I know uh, that he's busy trying to put some structures together for them to play with. And um, we've spoken throughout the course of the season that how many Kiwi girls applying their trade and at the NRLW, but now the Warriors have come back. Talk about Portia Woodman mm. at one stage coming. Um, so many of the girls that have gone there, like Stacey Walker, doing amazing mm. things. Um, if they're able to get um, those guys to come back. Uh, Mele Hufanga, Ooh. superstar at the Broncos. If they could get her back, that'll be a big signing for them. And I'm sure the Broncos have just won the minor premiership for mm. the NRLW. Yep. Will do anything to keep hold of her. Yeah. But there are some other girls out there. I really like the signing of uh, Maya Hilmoana, mm. the front rower from the Roosters, from the Waikato area, coming back home. A bit like the fish. Yeah. Uh, opportunity to come back and, and represent their home country team. So she'll bring a lot of experience. Been to World Cups, been deep into the playoffs, and the Roosters, who finished second this year, should be hoping they can go deep and, and come across and bring all that experience with her. Yeah, great signings. I think great signings. The NRLW is back in in 2025 and everyone is waiting for some signing new, especially here now that the Warriors are all done. And uh, Uppy obviously was the first one. It's great to see her coming back. She's played for the Warriors before when they were playing. So it's great. Like you said, Willie, uh, the girls that are coming back from the Waikato. Um, and the good thing about me is some of these girls, like my... Um, at the Roosters Quality Club, knows how to win games, played in big games. Uh, Leishon Albert-Jones, I think that's Stacey Jones's niece. So, you know, she's come out of the Newcastle system that have won grand final. So important, as well as obviously trying to bring a few of our Kiwi or Māori girls home, it's important that you bring them from out of these good systems that have had some great coaching, that have been playing in finals football, that know what it's like to have, have, help, sorry, help, help other girls be the best that they can. I still think they're looking need a seven. I think there's some good Kiwi sevens over in Australia. Whether they want to come back to New Zealand and play for the Warriors, it's up to them. But you're going to need a good seven or a six just to get them around the field. Like you mentioned, you know, some of those girls that are doing well over there, um, you know, Stacey's been awesome. Obviously, she's got a fraction of tibia, I think. So, unfortunate for her, she's out for the rest of the year. Mille, oh, she's been dominant over in the competition. I think Broncos just won seven straight, so... Um, there's some good girls in the composition. Great women over there playing. And um, there's a couple of halves at the Dragons. Tyler King and yep. Racy McGregor. Get um, get get one of them over. You know what I mean? I think they definitely need a really good seven just to steer them around the park. They'll have everything else. They have some good quality, some tough up the front, tough middles up the front, and then a great fullback up here. You can, I think he scored. She scored her first try on the weekend for the Canberra Raiders, and it's crazy to say that their, their competition's all over. You know what I mean? They're done for the season, and they go into finals football. So. 
I think, what was that, 10 weeks? Nine weeks. Nine weeks. Like, Nine that's, that's quick. The game's moved so far. So, rugby league's a crazy game, man. But, yeah, great signings for the Warriors, and they're, they're getting ready to go. Preseason is not too far off. Yeah, apologies, Lavinia, by the way, um, for <laughs> botting your name. Uh, as you can see, I'm too par lungy for my own good. Uh, <laughs> last bit of news, the... Well, still not the last set of club awards, but a few more of the club awards announced. Uh, the Raiders with Joe Tarpanier, Meninga medal winner, and Ethan Strange, Rookie of the Year. Uh, mm. The Dolphins, Max Plath, Cut. Players Player, and Arthur Beetson, uh, Player of the Year. <coughs> Jack Bostock, Rookie of the Year. And the Knights... Dan Gagai cleaned up, got player of the year, player's player, and gladiator of the year, and then rookie of the year was Fletcher Sharp. You guys agree with those the clubs there? Yeah. They made the right calls. Yeah, all, all well deserved. I think the uh, the big the big news out of the Canberra Raiders and Joe Tuffin, he's also been named the captain for 2025. Mm. So, man, we got a Kiwi in there uh, who's who's proud of his culture. Both him and his wife, you know, both Indigenous, you know, Maori and, and, and Australian Indigenous, his wife. So it's great to see him doing good things. He is a leader. Uh, wherever he plays, although, you know, Canberra Raiders, New Zealand Kiwis and also the Maoris, like he leads by example. He's right up there with some of the best front rowers in the competition, whatever position he plays, either front or lock. So I think that's the, the biggest news for me when it comes to some of these awards. Yes, all those players deserve. I think Ethan Strange was great rookie of the year. Dan Gagai, Mac, Max Plath, I thought he was enormous for for the Dolphins and I think he deserves all those awards. Uh, and obviously Gagai cleans up at the Knights. You know, we like uh, Māori fella doing his mahi over there now. That's for sure. How good. Yeah, congrats to all of them. And well done, Joe Taps. Yeah. Tough season for the Raiders, but he stood out week in and week out. And whilst he wasn't the captain in name, he was a leader mm. for them. Now, I know uh, Elliot Whitehead, who was the captain, lent on him and Josh Papali'i mm. a lot. And he flourished in that. And uh, if anything was to happen to Fish, I have no doubt that he could captain the Kiwis too, mm. if need be. He's... Uh, come a long way from the young fella that first came yeah. to the Kiwi camp and went to Newcastle first. He's really grown and found a home and he's an icon and a legend now at at the Raiders. There's some good years ahead of him. And Max Plath is a big one for me. Just a rookie, could have got rookie of the year as well. Mm. Um, but been tough. And a bit like Tyron Wishart. It got some versatility. Mm. Uh, very similar players, but wholehearted wholehearted in his approach and in a pack that was down for a long time. They lost Flegler and um, Jeremy Marshall King was out for long periods in the season, so he had to play hooker. Then he went back to 13, but his game and his approach never changed. And they love that type of thing in Aussie. And uh, the NRL clubs in particular, Wayne Bennett, loved it. And it's great to see him there. Dan Gagoy, mm. been great for him. Oh, we said it before during the season. So happy that he was back in Origin. That was, along with this recognition, a big reward for how good he was going this year. Uh, and with that, we'll move on to the games for the weekend. Obviously, only two of them that we're going to talk about. Uh, round two of the finals, starting off with the Sharks versus the Cowboys at Allianz. 26-18 to the Sharks. Your guys' predictions, Adam. Well, well, both of you picked the Cowboys, so yeah, we're both we're, we're both off there. And um, yeah, when you look at this game, I think the Sharks had more to play for than. And I know, like, like it's finals football, and I know both teams have a lot to play for. But the Sharks, on the back of their performance, for the players that they do have in their team that are that are quality as well. They've got some great outside backs. They've got some great middles. They just get the job done. And then they've got a couple of halves who, one, didn't perform the week before, who had so much pressure on him, Nico Hines. But then in this game, Trindle just took over. Like he did, like he's done most of the season, I think. He's he's had his hand in everything. And, and it goes to show just when someone is under a bit of pressure, that's why it's called a team sport. Eh? It's a team sport. It's not an individual sport. But this guy could be right up there with the best six in, in the competition. The way that he's been playing this year 
with the amount of pressure that team's been on and the players that they've had in and out, he steered that team around with his kicking game, with his running game, with his passing. I think his first try was just competing, you know, and they are a team that competes as well, but he epitomizes the competing and that try that he puts a kick on off on a couple of offloads and then just wanted the ball more. They had to hold him back and that's what happens when um, someone is just putting themselves in the picture. I think in the in the two games that we played over the weekend, it's the, the ad-lib football that kind of got the opposition and put them under a lot of pressure because you've, you've built up your season around systems and structures defensively. You've previewed what they do. Once you chuck an offload in there, even if it hits the ground, it brings a team out of position, out of their systems, and you're trying to solve it. Every time they move the ball around or there's an offload, but like his first try, that's what caused a lot of the, the damage or that's what caused a lot of the threats around the football is, you know, they just did a few things differently. Whether it was on purpose, whether it wasn't, they just found ways to score points and they were strong, defensively come up. They had a big point to prove, I thought. Um, although we chose the Cowboys, I just thought the attack was going to be good enough. Defensively, I know they, they're, they're not, they weren't a strong defensive team, but, you know, Kyle Felt went down. Um, what's our center's name? Sorry, Val Holmes. He, he went down and, you know, it's really hard on the go to try and change a winger and a center into the team. Um, we've seen this year with the Warriors having to do that mid-game, how hard it was to try and make shift those positions. And when you're playing against some of the best teams at this time of the year, those guys, when you lose those guys, very hard to substitute them on and try and make a difference and try and win the game. But, you know, they competed. They tried hard, the Cowboys, but were out-competed by a strong, determined Sharks team led by Trindle himself. Yeah, they looked a lot like the side that went on that run at the start of the season. And I don't know whether it's something to do with the conditions, the faster track now, they're back to playing fast across the ground football, which uh, was the highlight for me to start the game. They started at a tempo that the Cowboys couldn't handle. And there was mixed with some of the ad-lib stuff. The try that Braden Trindle scores where he grubbers the kick through and it was held back from that 20 metre line, about 40 metres out, to when he scores a try, there's about eight passes mm. where they're just interchanging and they're pushing and supporting. They're causing so much chaos in the Cowboys' defensive line, they couldn't handle it to the point where he spots a gap, Trindle, kicks it through, and what Blairy said, they had to try and hold him back. Mm. And in doing so, they conceded the penalty try, but some of their football was outstanding. Braden Trindle scores on the right-hand side of the field, you know, soon after, and as you'd expect in a playoff game, yep. the team doesn't go away. The Cowboys had a bit of a moment. I thought they lost a real big moment when Drinkwater makes a break up the field and he tries to take on Will Kennedy on the outside, but he has Val Holmes just on his inside. Mm. I thought if he could either pass it back or flick it and get it somehow to, to Val Holmes, they could have scored that try, but he decides to hold it incorrectly in his right arm, he gave himself no chance to fend mm. and the tackle was conceded. That was a moment when they, I think they were 18 down, it was still half an hour to go, that could have sparked something to come back in them. But yeah, disappointed with the Cowboys because I picked them and disappointed they went. But yeah, worthy winners, worthy winners to go through this week. And I'm, I'm happy for the Sharks that mm. they got that monkey off their back. It was a big hoodoo and I said that last week. But they've shaken that off and their reward now is to go <laughs> against the Penrith side. Mm. Good luck for them. Like uh, Fitzgibbon said after the game, you know, probably everybody outside of their dressing room is thinking yep. they've got no chance. But they've got to have belief. Mm. They've got to have belief. If nobody else has got it, they've got to have it mm. if they're to have any chance of yeah, going to the grand final. And if you turn it into a doll fight, you just never know what happens, eh? I think... You know, as those teams resting, and I've been in those positions before, the whole mindset for those teams that are resting is if you blow them off the park in the first 20 minutes, uh, then the opposition goes, oh, you know what I mean? There's a big breath and they go, oh man, like, it's this is too hard. But if you turn it into a dogfight where you just stay in it, that's when it becomes whether you who wants it more in the end, you know what I mean? So I've been in those positions before when the opposition comes in and say, say like you're the team that rested, is that that's your mindset, bro, is you just take it away from them early and then they just 
they just can't stick with you because they've had to play two big games already, then play a big game to a team that's had a rest for two weeks. You know what I mean? And then you've got to play them. So I think the important thing is for the, both teams playing this weekend is, is to turn into a dogfight. Make it a dogfight and let's see who the best team that comes yeah. out on top. You know what I mean? If you allow the opposition, those two teams that have rested, the Panthers and the Storm that have rested, and if you give them a sniff, they'll just no. blow you off the park early. And that'll be the key. You know, Panthers will do exactly what they try to do to the Roosters their first game. Blow them straight off the park, first 24 minutes, see you later, and then just hang in there and just... Just be too critical in the end. Yeah, it's exactly Don't what you sorry. said. If you if you play the bulk standard style that you've done throughout the course of the season, what the opposition's previewed and prepared for, yeah. they'll handle that. You've got to throw something different. You have to. They've got to ask a different question and maybe something that nobody expects. Yep. Whatever that is that, that the Sharks come up with, they've got to come up with something different to add some shock value to the Panthers. Well, if there's in any, uh, any week to try like a trick play off a scrum or something like that, you know, off a kickoff, kick it out on, kick it out short or do something different, this is the week. Because, you know, you go into this game, Melbourne or Penrith will be like, oh, we just want to go into our systems and our structures, just run for it, run for it, blow them off the park, and then hopefully just blow them out and they can't keep up with us. But if there's a week to try and do something different, you have to have practice this though. You can't just go into the game just thinking I'm going to shoot a short kickoff or you know we're going to put a play in off the, a trick play off the scrum. Like you have to have practice these moments because you only get one shot at it. Yeah. And if it means that that could be the point of difference or the win or the loss of the game, then you have to execute. But yeah, you can't tuck the ball on if your wing and just go toe to toe with some of these two, the two of the best clubs in the competition this year. Just while we're on this, for you, what is more? Heartbreaking. What hurts more, losing a semi-final or losing the grand final? Nah, grand final. Grand finals it hurts more because yeah. you must have lost a week before. You know what I mean? Because like you, like this is the grand final. I think the semi-final before the grand final is the biggest game because there's no guarantee you get through this and play the grand final. The grand final looks after itself. Like the hype is already there. You can get up for that game, but for the semi-final, it's the biggest game of the season. If you get through there, you're into a grand final, and then that's that takes care of itself. But this game, you put all your eggs into this basket here to try and win this yeah. one because you get to the grand final, you lose, you're like, I should have just lost last weekend. But you put so much effort into that game because the reward is the GF, and then whatever happens on that day happens because it looks after itself. You know, the two best teams go at it. You can get yourself up because it's a grand final. You can play the best footy of your life because that's your last game, and you go, all right. Whatever I do today, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to tuck the ball and run the hardest like that's a brick wall and I'm going to break through it because tomorrow it doesn't matter. Tomorrow it doesn't matter. It's right now and right then. So I think the biggest game is the semi-final. Winning that one and losing that one is most probably the worst one too. Yeah, that's for me. Losing a semi-final, knowing that you were 80 minutes away mm. from going to the big dance mm. and so many players... Never have there. lost semi-finals and never seen yeah. the big dance. Never yeah. walked out on grand final yeah. day. And, yeah, when you lose a, a semi-final, when you haven't been there, yeah. you, that question hangs over you. Am I ever, ever, ever yeah. going to get that chance? And that's it, bro. It's like, like I said, it, the grand final looks after itself, but you need to win that yeah. one. That's the one you want to win. You want to win that because, man, it's like, yes, I'm into a grand final. Like you said, not too many people make grand finals and they always lose in the semi. The grand final looks after itself. Like you can get up for that game, but if you don't even get there, it's like, yeah. man, just what ifs, you know? So those what ifs turn into just whatever I do, I put my body on the line for this game and then it's one more game and you're into the grand final. That's how yeah. you got to see it, you know? So big game, yeah. big game, bro. Um, just back on the ga the Sharks versus Cowboys, um, when I was watching the game, the commentators were blowing up at that first try, right, that it was awarded as a penalty try. Uh, I think their reasoning was he wasn't going to definitely get to the ball, Trindle, before Dearden, I think, was the last defender. And so they thought it shouldn't have been given as a guaranteed penalty try. What Did you guys have a take on that, whether it was a penalty try or a professional foul? or Yeah, I don't think um, anyone had any complaints after the game as in coaches um, because you either lose a player, which in the context of the game is huge. You know, in, in, the, in prelim finals where the game's on the line, you win or lose, 
Like you can always try and come back and, and score more points, but you have your whole team on the field. I think it was definitely a try. I think there was no one. He was moving at speed. He kicked it early. So he was. I think he was always going to get there. I know there were some people around him, but if he doesn't get tackled, dead and doesn't get to the ball anyway, I don't think so. I feel, I feel like that's a fair penalty try in, in my mind, in my opinion. I think he deserved that. Otherwise, the other option is his 10 minutes in the bin. Which one would you want to take? I don't know. If you're a coach... Willie, if you're a coach in the team, which one would you take? The try or the six points or the yellow card? I'll take the yellow card. Yep. I'll take the yellow card and keep the nil or score line. But I I side with the commentators on this one. He was that far away. And a penalty try, as I have always understood it, mm. has to be 100% mm. inconclusive. Now... There's nothing to say that he would have cramped up or tripped over and stopped. The ball may have bounced a different direction. Yeah. Already, that 100%'s already come down a little bit. So it's not 100%, regardless of whether he's the closest to the ball or yeah. not, which is how they're calling it nowadays. I, I didn't think it was 100 clear-cut percent that it would have been a try. Yeah. Penalty, 10 minutes in the back. I, I actually thought it was going to be a penalty yellow, yellow card. And then I couldn't argue when they gave him a try anyway. Yeah. I was like, oh, either either raw, you know, if I was a coach here, yeah, you'd take the take the the yellow, but at the same time, you know what I mean? Like it could have gone either way. I don't think anyone complained about it as well. It, except for the commentators. It was almost as like as well that the the penalty try was more demoralizing than losing a uh, well, it would have been Cotter that got sinbinned. And he's a big part, you know what I mean? And, yeah. you know, he's a big part of what their team has been doing, um, you know, and he's, I think he may have thought he was going to get a yellow card as well. Um, but again, like, these are the best players in their in their team and you could you can defend and you can play a, a six-point lead. I feel, I feel like these they would have backed themselves yeah. to be able to score points with their whole team on the field. It obviously didn't work out that way. So either or, you either get a penalty try or a yellow card, I think they, they back themselves to defend it. Uh, last one for this game. Uh, referee Ashley Klein, who, let's be fair to him, cops a lot of heat. He's cops some heat from us on this show, but just in the general NRL space, he's often a target. Uh, but have to give the props to him. He's the second ever person to control 400 NRL mm. games, which is an achievement in itself for a referee. Yeah, aren't they all? They do cop it from everyone, bro. Not only just us, but a lot of people out in uh, either the media, uh, the fans. So to be able to, you know, ref 400 games of NRL matches, it's huge. It's a massive achievement, you know what I mean? Like you're out there week in, week out. That That's that's massive. I think, you know, I played 15 years. How long has he been running around for? Well, a lot of people don't know this, but he actually decided on his own back to come across to England and started refereeing in Super League. And he was a referee in Super League for a good five or six years, back wow. in the black and white days when I was playing. Wow. <laughs> so that's how long he's been a referee. And then crazy, you know, he did a couple of grand finals over there and did some big games. He built himself up. And we talk about players going over and learning their trade, and he did it as a referee and then decided to come over here, come back to Australia and become a fully-fledged NRL ref. And it was great to see him as a Super League person, to see someone from Super League to go through and mm. become such an influential figure in the NRL as him. To get 400 games, um, full props. He's a good fella, is Ash. And you, know, you get to know each other a little bit more intimately in the Super League because it's not a big community. So it'd be to see him come and do some grand finals and origins and... And you know, build himself up to being close to the number one referee and do 400. Yeah, fantastic achievement. Uh, then the second game was the Roosters versus the Seagulls, also at Allianz. 40-16 to the Roosters. Adam, you picked the Seagulls. Willie, you picked the Roosters with James Tedesco as the man of Yo. the match as well. So good. Two points? <laughs> yeah. Two points. Well, man, I should have been counting, yeah. I'm still on zero. Yeah, two points. <laughs> That's 2-0, but crazy start to this game, eh? And it just right, it was, going. it was a powerful start. Wow, we, I don't think we've seen in the game of rugby league two people get HIA'd in the space of 25 seconds and two play that were like, you know, two hit-ups. Um, 
I think the last time I seen a big game, and it wasn't knockouts, it was the 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 Origin three. How and how much intensity that that game had. This is right up there with those games. I think you know, obviously, Jared being back uh, was a big part of you know, the Roosters team. Victor Radley, who everyone had thoughts on, maybe how is he going to play with his with his fracture? But man, he was. They, I think just having those two guys in the team. Gave a lot of confidence to their their pack and also Tedesco and the way that he played on the back of those powerful runners. I thought Lindsay Collins was so much better this week than he was last week, but I think so was so was um, Spencer as well. I just think the confidence that those two bring to the team, uh, Victor Radley and Jared, boosts the confidence of everyone around. They get they know what their job is and they play a, a powerful game through the middle of the park and then allow the outside backs to have a bit of fun. Joey Manu's obviously at the back there doing what he does, Joseph Suali'i, the way that he plays at the back as well. I think, you know, between those people and Tedesco and what he's created, these guys are just, they're on another world, bro. They were they were huge. They were huge, like 40 points. That that Manly team's not a not an easy team to beat. Like, they play some football as well. They've got some great attacking power We're through their team, obviously led by Cherry Evans, but no it's to be seen. I thought they suffocated them with the intensity of the, how they ran the ball. They asked questions every time they carried. Crichton was a lot better with his discipline around offloading. I thought, you know, he created some momentum. Uh, there's some big jobs on Olokoatu, who had a big job out there, and he was trying his Hamoli was working hard, man. He put on some shots. Damn. Imagine if he was Sam Mourn, bro. Had him just start <laughs> Mourning. Or even a Kiwi, bro. Like, holy, this guy is a beast, man. So, yeah, I just thought the better team won. The team that played with the most intensity and competed for the 80 was the difference on, on the game. Is like they were just huge, the Roosters. And then, obviously, like you said, Tedesco, enormous. Um, and I know this conversation at the moment, who's going to be the Aussie fullback, but holy, he's been putting his hand up consistently the last maybe, you know, eight weeks to be able to, you know, give himself a chance to be playing. I know he's had some disappointment through origin time. Dylan Edwards is there. Are they moving in that direction? Kalen Ponga's name's come up as well, but Tedesco hasn't done himself, like he's, he's done himself more favours than not because he's been playing so consistent and been really good for them. So... Another dominant performance right from the get-go from the, the Roosters. But, you know, they've been a bit like that. One more game and then the big dance if they can get through, you know, the, the Storm. Who last time when they played, big Jared and Nelson, whoo, they went at it. They went at it and I seen Victor Radley. I think he spoke to a media, spoke about how much intensity that Jared and um, Nelson had and how they're going to go at each other again. I think they're just fueling the fire because... It's going to be fireworks right from the kickoff. Same thing. Like, Jared's going to take that first hit up. I think Craig Bellamy's smart. He's going to chuck Nelson straight in there as well and just, like, just go power for power and good luck to the best team. May the best team win there. Holy. Be a big game, that one. Yeah, I think it was the commentators pre-match. It might have been uh, Cooper Cronk talking about the effect of that having Jared mm. and Victor Radley just sitting in that dressing room and you're sitting opposite them, seeing that they're going to be in the trenches with you. The confidence that you gain by having those two warriors, those two soldiers back out on the field, because you know they're so reliable. You know what they're going to deliver. And Jared delivered right on the first tackle. <laughs> Wasn't too impressed with Kohler's tackle technique. Mm. He got, a, got himself into some trouble. We spoke about it before, about coaching technique and being safe. There was no technique. He got his head totally in the wrong space. And when someone's charging you like the raging bull that Jared was to start that game, he was gone. He was clean out. But then the next tackle, it's Jake Trebojevic, who is one of the best, best tacklers tackle in the Tackle technique, combo. usually Yo. spot on. And Collins, he it's nails him. So they were fortunate Trebojevic comes back on, but the collar one really hurt them because mm. it hurt their rotation. They had to put Ben Trebojevic out into the centre, so they lost that forward rotation. Who I thought did a good job. Who he I did. thought did a good job, yeah. but, you know, you lose a strike. You do, and you've got to leave players out there for a bit longer. Mm. Now, I think in the whole scheme of it, I, to play the Roosters, you've got to have, have an even spread of field position. It was all down mm. ma uh, Manly's end of the field. They just squashed them. They, they squeezed the living daylights out of them, and it was all good ball Bully for the mate. Roosters. There was some ad lib. There's some ad lib play we spoke about. Cronulla coming up with some of it, and there was 
a little bit of a point of difference. Uh, Tyrone May, Terrell May flicks a ball out to nobody. Sandon Smith picks it up. He plays to the line with Tupanua threatening, puts uh, Dara Daly Cherry Evans in two minds. Yep. Where to go? He just shifts his weight. Sandon Smith scores a try. But again, the Roosters, I really loved the moment of the game for me was uh, Tedesco's first try when they start on the right-hand side of the field and they play, they play with a lot more wits this week and they got to the middle, but by going to the middle, they caused some disruption with Aloye. He's had to come and bite in a bit harder, which he didn't really need to, but in doing so, they found Homolia Olukoyatu mm. quite wide, which meant Joe Chaboyevich has had to get around the corner the next play, they get straight to uh, Daly Cherry Evans, almost around the scrum line. He makes the tackle. Because Olukayatu's made the tackle before, he's slow in getting around the corner, which meant Jaboyevich, who's travelled from the other side all the way across, they find him. It's last play. Uh, the wing is tucked back. I think it's Leo Opuati. He's back in the line. And then Kiri just goes at the line, out the back to, mm. to Tedesco. He finds Tupou, makes a break back inside to Tedesco. Just really smart build-up, smart scheming, smart play, and even smarter execution. Trying to work and move the big fellas around without Tuboyevich having to make a tackle, but having to make him travel almost 40, 50 metres and fatigue him that way and then shoot him on last play. Just great football. And then attacking-wise, there's no question about their ability. Mm. I've still got some questions about their defence. They didn't have to do a lot of it because they squeezed Manly field position wise to be down their end. Now, when Manly got the opportunity to go up, I think they got three, three good ball chances. Yeah. They converted all three. Mm. That's the question I've got still. Yeah, yeah. But great, great game from the Roosters. Score forty points in a in a semi final. <laughs> That's a great effort. And put so, Manly so, to the so end. He's kicking. Like he had some tough kicks from yep. the sideline, but. Was on point. What is it? Twenty nine out of twenty nine attempts. Yeah, he has never missed a kick. Has it? Has it missed a kick? So like he's got some kicking ability about him, about him as well as well as some toughness and that, well as an athlete, and he can compete in the air. So yeah, um, yeah. Oh, and that's the other thing for them. They competed on every play. That last play from Joey Manu where yeah. he gets up <laughs> and just cruises. Yeah, casually. Yeah. Tucks it to Don Young and put the ball down. Hey, that's what we do. Mm -hmm. It was almost some of that, but yeah, they're a quality football team. Uh, Tedesco's 250th game, Education. obviously. Looks like he's on track to play 300. Uh, you know, no injuries, hopefully, over the yeah. next couple of seasons. He should be able to get there. Uh, he's not going to win the Dally M, in our opinion, as we've discussed. Oh, uh, he'll, be, he'll be but pushing. Yeah. He'll be knocking yeah. on the door, bro. He'll be knocking on the My door. My question is, how does he, in his 250 games so far, stack up against some of the all-time fullbacks? Uh do you reckon he's oh, up there Everyone's this? just so different in the style of play that they play, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like, and we look at times of errors of when they come into, and that's how I feel like, I, you know, and I played alongside Billy Slatter, and he most probably moulded a lot of the fullbacks to what they are now. Um, I wouldn't say Billy Slater was the toughest fullback, but gee, he was the fastest, the most skillful, and the most competitive player I've played alongside. You know, as he got through his career, like, that's when Manu Vatuvai was jamming him at the back, you know what I mean? And you had to be really good with your skill, <coughs> had to be really good with your soft skill and your catch and pass and stuff like that. But everything he did, he was, he competed. Like, he'd come out of a Melbourne system that that's what they pride themselves out as out competing the opposition. He trained like that. He played like that in everything he did. Any ball on the ground, if you picked it up, you knew just to look up and Billy Slater was there. I think he... He moulded a few of the way that the fullback started when he come through, and then everyone else is just trying to bring their own little style. And everyone has to be better at their soft skill passes, their so short hands. Not every fullback can pass the ball, uh, but a lot of them are getting better. Tedesco is great with what he does. Um, you know, sniffs around the middle of the park. The game's changed a lot since Billy Slater was playing. A lot of inside balls back to Billy off Cameron Smith and Cooper Cronk. Now, I think the fullbacks just sit around the middle of the park and do a lot of those sniffing on that. Even that, what's that fourth tackle? They make that last play to get a quick play of the ball. Before, I think the Storm used to kick for Billy up high and he used to go and compete. So the game has changed a lot. And I think everyone's they're, they're quality. He's a quality fullback. Uh, he's, he's Aussie. He's New South Wales captains. 
Um, he's done a great job with what he's been able to do. He's a great player. 250 games, man. That, that's huge. Like he said, he'll go close to playing 300. They keep playing finals football and, you know, fingers crossed, he keeps creating history for himself. Yeah, Billy's my number one. Billy Slater's my number one from everyone that I've mm. seen play the game. And I go back to when Tedesco was at the Tigers and the Roosters signing. There's a lot of fanfare about his signing and it was a big signing. I didn't quite see it mm. at the Tigers at the time out of him, but the way that he's gone on to have the career that he's had at the Roosters and to lead his country, lead his state, and probably today... He's, there's some comparisons with him and Dylan Edwards. Yeah. You know, and, and probably rightly so. Dylan Edwards cleaned up grand finals for the last three years. I think Tedesco may have won one, maybe two um, with the Roosters. But for longevity, he's probably just pipping him at the moment. But, yeah, he's, he's been great. And, and talk about Billy Slater and what he, he used to do. He's got some of that as well. There was that last play on the weekend where uh, they shift the ball out. Kerry gets some kick pressure, passes it back to Crichton. Mm. There's nothing doing, and they're still in their half. He just finds Tedesco, he just mm. screams up the middle, finds some space. His kick couldn't quite connect. Didn't get the bounce for Dom Young, but that's the type of off-the-cuff dangerous player that he has been. Been off for a couple of years. You know, he's not been at his best, but he's definitely found it. And when they find their form and they play the way that he's playing at the moment, we remember back and we connect all the good times that he was yeah. The, you know, previously before that little lull that he had. But yeah, he's in the top three or four of all time. But Billy, yeah, that's my number one. Mm. Uh, and last one on this game. How how much is can Sandon Smith replicate the work of Sam Walker in the seven? Can it help them maybe win their game against the Storm? Like, obviously, that's a massive game that they're about to play. But... I know they're different types of players, but how much can he replicate the effectiveness of Sam Walker playing as the halfback? Well, it all depends on, I guess, the middle of the pack because that's how they built, created momentum. The other day, they played a lot of their football attacking the line. Eh? And for any half, it's the best place to be able to get your hands on the ball and attack. That's, that's what your job is. So the battle will be won between the middle of the park. And when the battle's won there, whether it's the Storm or the Roosters, that's when the likes of of uh, Sandon Smith comes in, Luke Carey, and they're able to play their shape with some of the strike power that they have out wide. So that, like, you, you see some glimpses, you see some really good things that Sandon Smith can do and what he's been able to create, but it'll all come off the back of, of the forward pack. If the forward pack dominates, he comes into his own and vice versa for the Melbourne Storm. So he's got some talent, there's no doubting that. He's got some talent, he, he's a great footballer, he's got some speed, he's got some toe, he can kick a ball. But it all depends on the forward pack. Jared Wadia Hargreaves has to stand up again. Victor Radley, all those middles have to stand up again and go after the Melbourne Storm. Don't even try and be Sam Walker. Just be you. you know, he's got there on the back of what he's done at New South Wales Cup and his opportunity came when Sam Walker got injured. But you don't have to be Sam Walker. You know, you've just got to be the best Sandon Smith that you can be. And he was pretty damn good on the weekend. As Sam. Sam Walker's got the best short kicking game in the games at this moment in time. Does he have to try and replicate that? No. He's just got to kick well, whatever fashion kick that he comes up with. He's got to help Luke Carey organise his team and run them around. Luke Carey's won a grand final on his own with Cooper Cronk with one arm. So he can do that. He's just got to support him well and be the best player that he can be. And with that, we'll go on to our this week's predictions for uh, this weekend's games. Uh, obviously, there are two favourites, one for each of these games that everyone... If you're, if you're picking, you know, just purely who do you think is going to win if your life depends on it, it's probably the Storm and the Panthers. But let's see what you guys have to say about who's going to win these games. Storm versus Roosters... At Amy Park on Friday, Adam Willey, what is going to happen? In I'm going to say this goes into Golden Point. I reckon this is going to be the closest game of the of the round. I think uh, it will end up going uh, Storm to win by one. I think Peppy kicks the one point. I think Jerome Hughes gets the Golden Point. I think it oh, gets the man of the match. I think it's going to be 18-19. 18 to 19. Does that really? work out? Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, yeah I've, I've got the storm by eight. 
I think a, uh, and it's a comfortable eight. I think the Roosters score late on to make it eight. They, I think I can see them chasing it. Mm. Pappenhausen. Okay. I think Jerome Hughes is just too obvious. <laughs> <laughs> and then Panthers versus Sharks at a core on Saturday. Well, I'm going to go Pan- Panthers. Two experience in these big games. They know how to get it done. You've seen their first game and how they blew the opposition off the park. I think they're going to be too uh, clinical. And, you know, obviously we'll go for the obviously cl- Cleary to win, to win man of the match. Um, I think it's going to be... 24-12, I think they're going to be too strong defensively and they'll go away and win it comfortably. Panthers by 20. Hiding. Brian Tort to score a hat-trick. Eesh. Eesh. And man of the match. Yep. Okay, I have one question for you guys then. If Which of the two underdogs for these games is the more likely winner? Because obviously you've both picked... Storm and Panthers. If one of them were to win, who's the more likely of the two? Oh, I think for for me, the Roosters. That's why I've gone for the close game. I think this is going to be a battle. I think this is going to be a bit of a gladiator-style game where there's going to be people falling over. There's going to be some HIAs. This is going to be bigger than the last game the Roosters played. And, you know, between Jared, Nelson, Victor Adley and the boys that they have in their teams, I think this is going to be a gladiator-style game where it's just going to be... Bang for bang, toe yeah. for toe. Who's going to be the last one standing, pretty much? I don't think Joseph Swilly, Joey Manu, Jared, Luke Kerry, I don't think they're ready to finish it. The only reason I ask is because obviously last week I was in the same boat as you guys when the Cowboys played the Sharks. I thought, oh, the Sharks have no chance. They've been so inconsistent. They come out with a performance like that and they, as they have done at random points, that massive win over the Sea Eagles that they had as well. Uh, I think in round 27. I wouldn't be shocked if they just suddenly are pulling out some masterclass of a performance off the back of, you know, Hines and Trindle again and they scare the Panthers. But yeah, that's the only reason I thought of that. Before we go home, as per usual, there's a little bit of spice of life to add into the show, as I alluded to at the start. Some international stuff. Oh, yeah. I mean, on one side here, we have a Kiwi's assistant coach. <laughs> on the other side, Samoa. So I thought, man, there's a pretty good idea for a little drafting challenge, I guess you could yep. call it, where Adam's going to pick uh, his lineup for the Samoa team, Tor Samoa. Yep. And Willie's going to do his for the Kiwis. Um, Adam, have you got yours together? You yeah, to I'm ready on? to go, bro. Yeah, yeah, ready to go. All right, I'm here. I'm looking at my phone, so I've got some names here. Fullback, Roger Torvasa Sheik. Just going to go for it real quick. Nice. Winger, Brian. Uh, centers, Isaac Tungo, Stephen Crichton. Other winger, Murray Tolangi. Dejan Asi, your 5 eight, your half, Jerome Luai. Uh, Stefano as your front rower, along with Danny Levi. Uh, Terrell May, Jaden Sua, Hilim Luki, Jace Tevanga. And I've got like an extended number, so you can chuck any of these fellas in there as well. Greg Marju, Tommy Talao, Spencer Lenu, Suo Falongo, Paula Muti, Royce Hunt, Herman SES and Lingi Sal, Carlos Tumavavi, Martin Tapau. So I chucked in a couple of um, guys that are playing in the Super League only because they're playing over there. These guys have played in those, yep. they've played in those games for a long time. They know what the riffing's like, they know what the style of football's played over there. And I think Herman SES is if not the, the highest offload in the competition over there at the moment and playing really well. I think Carlos umavavi has been around for a long time, knows what the what the refs are looking for over there. And Lingy Sal was your, one of your best players in the World Cup, I think, as a lock. I think he'd come in and he could play a versatile <laughs> position. So I thought I'd chuck in three three Super League players who are of Samoan heritage that could add some flavour to what uh, Samoa can deliver over there because they're playing in that competition over there week in, week out. Yeah, and I've gone uh, Young Kinney at fullback. Isaako Mulitalo, who were great for them in the final last year on the wings. Uh, Chans and Tomoko in the centres. Uh, Foran and Hughes in the halves. Fisher Harris, Marshall King, uh, Moses Liotta in the front row, Nakora, and Isaiah Papali'i, again from last year. Joseph Tarpani, Bench, Griffin Neem, Nelson Asufa Solomona. I've gone Ethan Strange. 
for this one <laughs> on the bench with Leo Thompson. That is a smoky. New South under 19s, is it? Is it? I know you said back at the start when we started. Maori, Maori, yeah, yeah, yeah. Doesn't it's, he want to rep New South? Isn't he going to pick up? I, I couldn't tell you, bro. I'm not the coach, eh? and I'm not the one that goes knocking on their shoulders. If it's coming, <laughs> if he if he wants to play for the Maoris, bro, like I'm straight on his door, brother, brother, Ethan, you're in, cuz you're my first pick. So yeah, a great, great team. Good Joey Taps to have a chat to him. Just, just <laughs> quickly, I think you might you may know Foreign is out because I think we've seen a oh, post okay. the other day. Um, so if, if Foreign's out. Because I think he's had an operation. I've seen him post up on social media. Who do you have instead? Ethan Strange. Ethan Strange. Cool. <laughs> chuck some Smokies in there, eh? Nice, yep. nice. Uh, we'll chuck up uh, those teams on the screen and you guys can agree or disagree uh, with, obviously, the expert opinions of these coaches. And who do you think would win if we could get this legendary matchup of Samoa versus New Zealand? Unfortunately, we're not going to get it this year, but, you know, future years and stuff like that. Samoa have got business in England and New Zealand in the Pacific uh, champs. But yeah. That's us, eh? Well, Fano, that's another episode here on Run It Straight. Uh, thank you for liking, or make sure you like and share our stuff. Subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. We do a live TikTok every Mondays, 9.15 to 9.45, if our brothers turn up on time and get it done. But I appreciate, guys, your love and support. Thank you very much. That was the NRL Week 2 Finals Review. Cheer the brothers.